Cool. So it looks like we have a small group today. So please jump in with any questions. Um, I'm starting with slides just so that I thought it would be nice to provide some context uh, to compare some of the other image analysis methods that we've talked about with what we'll talk about today. But although this is a Thursday, I'm going to mostly treat this like an image analysis office hours um, and demo a couple of different things. Um, but like I said, it's a small group. So please just jump in with questions and interrupt me. Um, we can talk about uh, things that are more or less useful, depending on what what you guys need. So um, we're going to talk about machine learning today, which we've done before, but specifically we're going to talk about um, a type of machine learning um, called deep learning, um, where we're going to be using uh, neural networks. And sorry, getting my what screen I'm clicking on right. Um, so I do not intend to give a talk on uh, everything about neural networks, but I just wanted to uh, start with a sort of basic image of what a neural network is so that we're all on the same page when we talk about um, implementing these in uh, image analysis. So the idea of neural networks is these algorithms are modeled based off of real neural networks um, in the nervous system. Um, and so the idea is that you have some inputs. Um, you can think of these like, like a sensory organ in your brain, like your eyes or your ears, um, where you're receiving some input about the world. The input in our case today would be, you know, some images that we want to analyze. Um, and then there's some hidden layers. It doesn't really matter what it means to call these hidden layers, but these are a series of neurons with connections. So these inputs are sending connections to this first hidden layer. This hidden layer is then connected to the second one, et cetera. And then ultimately there's some connections to some outputs, um, which will be the output of our neural network, the thing that we want to get out of it. So in the nervous system, this might be um, some motor neurons that are gonna initiate some, some motor sequence. Um, and the idea here is that based on some input information, you get a particular output. So if I someone is throwing something at me and I get some information in my in my uh, visual inputs, um, then I might initiate some motor action that makes me duck or something. And a different input, whether it's a pillow or a rock being thrown at me, might cause me to have different outputs. Um, and it's the same concept in using these neural networks to analyze things, um, is that based on your input, you should get a, a given output. And you might have heard people talking about training these networks. And so just like our nervous system, um, not every neuron is equally connected to another neuron. So even in these connections that are existing, so for example, this one being connected to these four downstream neurons, um, you can see there are lines indicating these connections. And throughout the learning process of our life or the develop developmental process of our life, we know that connections between neurons, uh, some are strengthened, some are weakened. Um, and in neural network uh, computation speak, we talk about the weights of these connections between different neurons or different nodes. Um, and so just like in our real nervous system in this neural network, as we train this model or train this network, um, some of these weights will be strengthened or weakened, um, increasing the connectivity between any of these neurons. Um, and the important thing is that we don't have to decide how that happens um, or what things are strengthened or weakened. What we do is we provide the neural network some input. And in the training case, we know what the output should be. So the neural network gives us some output and we can compare it with what we think the answer should be. Um, the neural network then knows whether it gets it wrong or right, and it can learn by updating some of those weights and trying to get the answer correct. Um, and this is, you know, in some ways comparable to the way that our brain sort of strengthens and weakens connections based on um, the information that it has received. Um, so that's um, the the basics of what I'm going to say about neural networks, we're going to talk more practically about when we implement these methods, how they're different from other methods that are not deep learning. Um, but it's really not necessary to understand all the intricacies of neural networks and, and how they're uh, functioning and how they're being trained. But if you do uh, care to know that, um, I've posted some, um, some of my favorite resources here. So if you like YouTube, um, there are two options here. So there's a playlist of just four episodes by um, Grant Sanderson, who uh, has created the three blue, one brown um, uh, YouTube channel. Um, I think a lot of scientists really like uh, his uh, episodes. Um, they come from a very math heavy background, um, but they make these, these concepts very approachable. I've mentioned his videos before in a lecture about um, Fourier transforms. So uh, he doesn't just talk about neural networks and data science-y things. He talks about all sorts of interesting math concepts and how they apply to real world scenarios. Um, another good one is Deep Lizard. Um, I think this is a couple, uh, but all the um, videos that I've watched are, are one member of said couple. Um, 
and there is this is obviously a longer playlist of 36 videos on uh, machine learning and deep learning fundamentals. And the difference in this one is uh, there's actually some exercises where you can do some of the, the programming that would be involved in um, building one of these neural networks and training one of these neural networks. Um, so if that's the, the side that you'd like to learn, then you can um, opt for the Deep Blizzard playlist. These are not all like 36 one hour long videos. They're relatively short. Um, but if you just want to get like a quick ability to give a 30 second explanation of what a neural network is and understand a little bit of the math um, in, a, in a really intuitive way, then maybe this uh, four episode playlist playlist is for you. Um, if you want to take an entire course, um, for those of us in the Harvard world, um, you might have heard of this class CS50, which has grown to a sort of cult-like following. Um, it's just an intensive introduction to computer science, but they now have uh, these series of offshoot courses that you might take after that intensive introduction, or if you already know a little bit about programming. Um, and so this is an introduction to artificial intelligence with Python, and they do a lot of interesting projects, um, one of which is on neural networks, but there's also things on, um, you know, search uh, algorithms and natural language processing and all sorts of interesting things um, in the in the realm of artificial intelligence. Um, and then finally, um, one that a lot of people recommend is this pl uh, TensorFlow Playground. Um, this is really nice because in a sort of graphical interface way, you can build a neural network. Um, you can choose some input features. You can add any number of hidden layers and create a number of neurons within those hidden layers. And uh, there's different data sets that you can play around with trying to classify. And, and what you'll see is that you might need a greater complexity to your network if you're trying to separate data that uh, you might be able to see there's one that's like a spiral here of um of two kinds of data that you're trying to classify into a blue and orange group. Um, and so this can help give you, if you're a sort of a visual person, it can help give you some of that intuitive understanding of how you might separate data with uh, neural networks. Um, but like I said, I really want to talk about um, the kinds of image processing that we've already been talking about and put these into context of why would I need deep learning um, compared to some of the other methods that we've talked about. I think that's a little bit more practically useful. Um, so the first case is what we talked about um, many weeks ago when we started these image analysis office hours is um, maybe the easiest kind of uh, image segmentation that you can do um, where you're just choosing a fixed threshold. And uh, the idea here is that you have a sort of one dimension of information. So you have all the pixels in your image and in this 8-bit image, they might hold a value from zero to 255. And so you can plot this histogram of these uh, intensity values of these gray values in your image and you or some automated algorithm can choose a point in this histogram where you say everything to the left of this i'm going to call background and everything to the right of this i'm going to call foreground or whatever object that you're trying to segment um, and so for every single pixel it's just saying okay is it above or below and puts it into one of those two classes so it's the probably the easiest kind of classification that you can do in uh, image processing. Um, and then we also saw an example of an instance that's not so different, um, but imagine you don't only have intensity values, but you also have some color information. So there's a little bit more richness in the uh, data that you have to uh, separate some pixels from other pixels. So this was an image of a leaf and a little ruler. Um, and we can see that there are different colors across this image. And so we could uh, do some unsupervised clustering methods to based on all those dimensions, um, you know, red, green, blue, and intensity, for example, um, you you would separate out uh, any number of groups from this image. And so in this case, we did some uh, k-means clustering where we decided how many groups we thought we had in this image, um, and it it clustered those into into different groups, and then we end up with a segmented image with I think uh, six, yeah, based on our color plot here, um, six different clusters. Then with k-means, um, in that particular instance, you choose the number of clusters you want to end up with. So it's uh, unsupervised, but you supervise it in a way by telling it how many clusters you have. Um, and then more recently, we talked about um, these kinds of trainable machine learning algorithms. Um, in this case, uh, this is from Elastic. Uh, but we also talked about this. Chris gave a great lecture uh, or image analysis office hours um, on IntelliSys. So Elastic and IntelliSys are doing similar things, where in this case, this is a supervised um, machine learning method where you are giving the algorithm some training data. So um, you can see these yellow lines here. So we painted on this image. This is some background. and. Uh, maybe hard to see, but these blue lines here were, again, pixels that were labeled as this is foreground. You don't have to just have two classes, foreground and background. You might have multiple classes, um, but you provided some training data that allowed this algorithm, without you telling it, 
exactly how to separate the foreground from the background. You're simply providing some, tra some training data. And all of these other pixels that you gave the algorithm no prior information about, you didn't say this is foreground, this is background, but it was able to learn from this data that you did give it, uh, these painted pixels, labeled pixels, it learned how it should classify everything else. So data that it's never seen before, it can then make a decision on whether that should be foreground or background. And that is most similar to what we're going to be talking about today. The idea that you're going to be training some algorithm to learn the appropriate ways to separate uh, foreground from background or any number of, of classes of information. Um, and this is a great method. Um, obviously, we talked about it both in IntelliSys and in Elastic, uh, an option in the Zen universe and an option in the open source universe. Um, and these are really fabulous methods. And I think um, many people have been trying them out and been very successful with them. So um, these are still definitely something that we would recommend. But why might these be imperfect methods? And, and why might you try something else, um, namely a, a deep learning or neural network solution? Um, so the first point is that you have to provide some training data. Um, and based on this image, that seems sort of trivial. We just painted some things on this image really quickly, um, and then we had a beautiful segmentation. And in many cases, it is trivial. It's a really quick training process. You just have to provide a little bit of information, and then it segments your image perfectly. Um, but that maybe suggests that it was already a pretty straightforward segmentation problem to begin with. Um, I think for many of you all who have been trying these things out, um, it's a little bit more uh, time intensive to provide uh, appropriate training data to really make sure that you're differentiating the borders of uh, what you call foreground and background. And Chris did a really nice job of showing sort of the right way to train and the wrong way to train and, and the way that you can uh, sort of be more or less successful. And proper training takes time. Um, the other problem is that you're typically training on maybe one image like this or maybe a couple of images. And so it's it seems like a lot of training data when you add up all the pixels, but it's a pretty small parameter space that you're training within. Um, and many of you, again, if you've been trying this out, might have noticed that you then do a different round of staining. So same experiment, but different round of staining, and you image it on a different day. And now suddenly the model that you trained um, so nicely for your other images maybe doesn't perfectly apply to these new images, and you have to provide a little bit more training data. That's not so bad, but um, it does mean that you have to sort of constantly keep up this training process. Um, the other uh, reality is that you have to select your training features. So um, if you remember from uh, our discussion of Elastic, um, this was the window where you chose the features that would be um, selected in this classification scheme. And in this case, it's using a random forest classifier. So this is not using a neural network, although in both IntelliSys and Elastic, you can use neural networks. But in the, the strategies that we demoed in both Elastic and, um, and in IntelliSys, we were using these random forest classifiers. Um, and so in both of those, you have to choose the features that you want to use to uh, make these decisions, to learn these decision points of whether something should be blue or or yellow in this in this example. And so you could have chosen some color or intensity features. You could have said edges are important or textures are important. And you can choose the scales over which um, those things might be relevant. And um, again, this can be trivial. You can just select all the features. There's ways to automate this process of selecting the optimal features um, based on the training data that you've provided. So this doesn't have to take you know, days and days to optimize um, your feature set. But I want to highlight that with these two points taken together, what it means is that you, the way that you have trained your classifier, um, in this case, a, a random forest pixel classifier, the training data that you've provided it and the features you've selected make it very specific to what you are doing. And if you sent it to a lab mate, it's pretty unlikely that it's going to work for their totally different image set. Um, and it also puts a lot of the onus on you to show that this is implemented correctly, that it does what you think it does, um, and that the segmentation that you get out the other end is sort of optimal. So it's okay, and, and it can be very successful, but it puts a lot of the onus on you. Um, and this is one key difference uh, between neural networks and this random forest classifier, is that uh, in the uh, implementation of these neural networks and in the training of these neural networks, um, those weights are being changed in a way that does not require your input or your sort of supervision. Um, it's supervised in the sense that you give it training data, but it is going to decide 
what features in your image or whatever your input is, um, what features are relevant to outputting the appropriate answer in, uh, out the other end of the neural network. And so that's one key difference. Here we have to select our training features, but with um, deep neural networks, we don't have to select our training features. We have our inputs and we provide the training data, what should the output be, but we don't have to, to tell the algorithm what things should you pay attention to, to decide whether this is foreground or background, for example. So um, that's already one key difference between this and the neural networks. Um, and then finally, this is not necessarily a negative, which is why I have the question mark at the end of it. I'm not saying that this is a negative, but um, what this is performing is semantic segmentation, meaning that for every pixel, it's deciding, is it, in this example here, is it blue or is it yellow? Um, it's not finding objects. It's for every single pixel making a decision, blue or yellow. Um, and so why might that be interesting or good or bad? Um, what, is that, what does that lead to you know, potential problems down the road if we're doing semantic segmentation? So um, here's an example where we have um, uh, an image of a bunch of nuclei, and some of them are very close together. So it's sort of clustered um, nuclei close together. Um, and here is an example of what you might get out from this pixel classifier, the semantic segmentation. And what you can see is that because these objects are close together, um, they have pixels that are touching. So um, at every case, I've just decided uh, foreground, background. And so everything colored in red here, we've decided is foreground or whatever uh, pixels of interest. And then as a second step, so this is sort of a bottom up approach, um, we're finding individual pixels and then we're going to connect them together into objects. And here, this is probably going to be connected into one large object because all of these pixels are touching. And so this is a problem uh, with this semantic segmentation when you have very clustered objects. One solution to this, and again, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we went through um, IntelliSys and Elastic, is that you, rather than having two classes, foreground, background, you could have foreground, background, and edges. And these edges would serve as a third um, group that you were training on, and they would serve to separate uh, neighboring clustered objects. So in this case, we'd have this blue class, and that would allow us to not classify these pixels as red, but we would classify them as edges, and thereby separate these two neighboring objects. So that would be one solution. Um, and here's uh, an example of, of this being implemented. So in this case, um, this is using a neural network rather than the random forest, but it's still doing um, semantic segmentation. So this pixel by pixel um, classification. Um, and we have three input images of uh, different nuclei clustered uh, more or less together. And you can see that with two classes, I'm sorry for the color scheme here being red green, but all of these nuclei are red here, which means that they weren't segmented properly, um, likely because they were touching and were segmented big blob instead of individual nuclei. Um, the same is true here, maybe less bad, less clustered of an image. And um, this one here is really bad. Probably over half of the nuclei are red, meaning they were failed. They failed to be segmented properly. Um, but then if you train with three classes, so again, those border pixels, uh, interior and background, um, then this improves the situation. So we have far fewer red nuclei. So these are red here, um, these are red here, and everything else is green, so everything else went well. This image down here is still struggling a lot. Probably still half of the nuclei are segmented improperly. Okay, so an improvement, it's not perfect yet, but an improvement. So this alone could uh, improve your um, semantic segmentation using things like Elastic or, um, or using IntelliSys is adding in that third class. Um, but what about a totally different strategy? So I mentioned that this was sort of a bottom-up strategy where you found all the individual pixels, um, decided whether they were foreground, background, and or edge, um, and then you combined everything into objects. But what if instead we tried to find objects right off the bat? What if the output of our neural our neural network was finding the boundaries of objects rather than making these decisions on a pixel by pixel basis. Um, and this is something that you might have seen on, uh, you know, I, I think of it as like the mask RCNN images of, uh, 
of cars on a road and finding all the cars or all the street signs or something. You see these bounding boxes around all the objects. Um, and so this is called an instance segmentation rather than a semantic segmentation. So it's finding every object instance rather than a pixel by pixel uh, classification. And so what, what you could do after this and what the mask or CNN does is it finds a bounding box and then it decides, okay, inside this box, what is uh, foreground and background, for example. Um, but in this case, all I'm showing you are the bounding boxes. So this solves our problem in some ways because we can see that it has uh, found bounding boxes for all three of these nuclei separately. But we have a new problem, which is that because we were using bounding boxes, which are obviously much larger than uh, the nucleus itself in, a, in a some dimensions, so along this axis here, we can see that we have a lot of extra space in this bounding box that is not taken up by our, our nucleus of interest. Um, these bounding boxes are very overlapping. So if we try and fit our objects, which are blob-like, to boxes, um, then when we have crowded objects, we will have crowded boxes and very overlapping boxes. And um, one step in this kind of instance segmentation is you throw away uh, regions of interest that are too overlapping. So these bounding boxes uh, in the red hashed outlines are going to be discarded because they're too overlapping with this uh, central green object. So we've solved one part of the problem, which is now we don't just have one big object, but we've thrown away a lot of the data. We've taken some of these nuclei, some of these objects that are good and we want to keep, but we've thrown them away because the boxes are too overlapping. But we know that nuclei are probably not going to be box shaped. Um, they're going to be blob like. And so what if we still used this top down approach, this sort of instant segmentation approach, um, but instead tried to fit different kinds of regions, different shapes, um, and, and not just boxes. And so that's what this method star dist does. So it's doing instant segmentation, but it's fitting uh, star convex polygons rather than um, boxes. And you can see that these fit the shape of nuclei much more closely, such that if you have two neighboring nuclei, um, this is not the same image, I don't have the exact same image um, segmented with this method, but um, you can see that these bounding boxes would be very overlapping if they were boxes, but here because they're these star convex polygons, um, they fit the shape of the nucleus rather nicely. Now they don't fit it perfectly, so they don't fit it as perfectly as a pixel, a semantic segmentation would do. So you can see here that there's a little part of this that's sticking out of the star convex polygon. There's parts where this edge is a little bit too smooth. It should be, you know, a little bit concave in here. So there are problems here because it's trying to fit this particular shape still to something that is not perfectly a star convex polygon, um, but it, it it improves compared to the bounding box, but there is still a difference with what would be segmented on this lone, well isolated nucleus. If you used a semantic segmentation, you certainly would not call some of these pixels right here as a part of your object because they would be classified as background because their intensity is very dim or, or whatever features you were using. So um, you, can, you can know that there would still be differences um, in using this method versus this, but I think that this shape parameter um, is superior to using bounding boxes to find the nuclei. So um, what they're going to do is they're going to train, what they have done is they'll train a neural network. Um, this is a, a close to UNET architecture um, for those that have seen UNET uh, popular architecture for neural networks used in image processing. Um, and what this neural network is going to output is not foreground background, but it's going to output a few different things. Um, first, object probability. So for every pixel, it will have an object probability. Um, and it will also output these star convex polygons basically for every pixel, it's going to predict, predict these uh, radial distances to the object uh, border. And you'll be able to predict that across the image so that here I'm not showing you every pixel or, or they're not showing you every pixel, but this is a sample of potential pixels in the image. And the predicted uh, object polygon that would surround that pixel. And so you get this for every single pixel in the image. Um, you would 
you have very low probabilities of finding these in the background because you'd have very low object probabilities there. Um, but within an object, you could get many, many, many overlapping polygons, um, but you're going to choose the polygon with the highest probability. And that's ultimately what the network is going to output. So that's this non-maximum suppression step, this NMS step. So you end up with uh, ideally one polygon per object. One uh, image that helped me uh, conceptualize this as well comes from, uh, there's some really great example Jupyter notebooks on the Stardust GitHub, and they show an example of uh, the number of rays used to create these star convex polygons. So uh, you saw a point in the middle and a bunch of lines radiating out, um, and how many lines do you need? So in the example where you have four rays, you can see all these diamond-like nuclei all over the image. So clearly this doesn't quite capture what a nucleus looks like or any kind of biological blob looks like. Eight rays does a little bit better. And you know, as you add more and more, you get better and better until maybe you're making really only modest improvements on, on the shape feature. So I think that um, they're using 32 rays. Um, I'm not positive on that, but um, I hope this sort of illustrates the idea of what those rays are doing to create that star convex shape. So this is ultimately it. This is what we're outputting. We're finding objects and we're finding objects that can be represented by these star convex polygons. Okay, so that's the first difference with what we did with elastic um, and IntelliSys compared to what we're doing here is that we're not doing uh, semantic segmentation, pixel by pixel deciding is it foreground, background, but we're finding objects or instance segmentation. The other major difference is on the idea of having to train this yourself. So I mentioned that with Elastic, with IntelliSys, you have to provide a lot of this training data yourself. And if you go from image to image, even though they appear the same to you and you perform the experiment in the same way, you might find that there's enough variability that your pixel classifier just doesn't work as robustly to separate um, your nuclei from background or whatever it is from background, um, as well as it did on the previous images. And one big reason for that is, like I mentioned, we're training it on really small data sets. We're training it on like 10 of our images or even 100 of our images, which compared to the way that we train, uh, you know, neural networks for like self-driving cars is just dramatically undersampling, you know, the space of images that we could use to train these neural networks. And so in this case, um, and, and not just artists, this is one example of this kind of, um, deep learning for, for uh, image segmentation um, approaches is that they took a really large data set and trained this neural network with it so that it's pre-trained for you to be able to use. And the data set that they used was from this data science bowl that was organized by the Carpenter Lab over at the Broad, um, the people responsible for Cell Profiler. Um, and they recognized this need in the biological imaging community that we need large data sets. Like we have tons of images of cats and dogs and cars and street signs. And that's part of the reason why uh, the computer vision field is so good at recognizing cars and images and facial recognition databases, for example, that we just have massive uh, databases of images. And we need the same thing for biological image data. And so this is an example of um, tons of images of nuclei that were labeled by uh, experts, biologists. And it's not just fluorescent nuclei. Um, there's H&E stains. There are all sorts of bright field images um, uh, segmenting nuclei from background. And so this was an effort to make this network pre-trained and robust to apply it to anyone's imaging data. So that's the idea here is that it's pre-trained and you don't have to train it and it should just work. Now, of course, there's a big asterisk by that. It's not going to work for everything, um, but we're going to demo in it demo in just a few minutes just to show you that in, in many cases it works quite robustly out of the box without you having to train it on what is a nucleus and what is not um, or what is a other kind of biological blob and what is not. Um, this also exists in 3D, so they released Stardust 3D. Um, as far as I know, this is not yet a Fiji plugin, so Stardust is a Fiji plugin, and we'll go over that. Um, I have, if it is in, if th the 3D version is in Fiji, I haven't played with it yet, but it exists in their um, Python package, um, and so you can implement this in a Jupyter Notebook, so if anyone is interested in implementing this, um, there's great example scripts on their GitHub page, um, and if you want any help going through those, um, we'd be happy to provide that. 
Um, and so just circling back to that first uh, set of example images that I showed you with either the two class or three class um, semantic segmentation, um, we can compare Stardust alongside and see that it is even a further improvement compared to um, even using three classes in your semantic segmentation. So we have fewer of these um, nuclei that were uh, segmented, uh, that were clustered together and segmented as one object. Okay, but, um, oh, and one more thing is if you want to get any more information about these things, um, there's a couple of good sources. So I mentioned a few weeks ago, uh, this New Bias Academy, um, these series of seminars that are happening throughout the week, every week um, on a variety of uh, bio image analysis um, questions. Um, they've been really fantastic and luckily they have all been recorded and so they're on their YouTube channel now and there is one on Stardust. There's a couple on Elastic um, and these are given uh, by the developers of these tools and so um, you really get a sort of first-hand account of how they work um, and so they're a really fabulous resource to, to look at. Um, also, if you have questions about implementing any of these methods, of course, you can definitely come to us. Um, but also the image.sc forum is a great place. Um, I know that I have posted questions about Stardust um, and, and the developers of Stardust are, are on this site um, and the developers of Elastic and, and all sorts of things. You can see all the community partners down here. Um, and so you're likely to get a response either from someone who, who's used the technique really extensively or from the developer of the technique itself. So a uh, really sort of unprecedented level of help on this kind of, on this form of form. And, you know, we're all working from home now. So um, I think people are pretty quick to respond. Um, okay. but one other example, the Stardust is one that I've used, I really like, and it works really robustly. Um, but I want to emphasize that this is, they're not the only ones with these kinds of ideas of training these neural networks with large volumes of data, and also some interesting tricks of how it's performing this uh, instance uh, segmentation. Um, so Stardust was one. Another is cell pose. And the motivation of cell pose is that um, what some of you might be thinking in your heads right now is not everything that I'm interested in in biology is blob-like. Um, in fact, many cells, not nuclei, are not blobs. Um, and they have very interesting cell shapes and things that would not be well segmented by a star convex polygon. And so what um, this neural network outputs, um, it's based on training data that thinks about um, the way they basically simulate diffusion from the center. So if you put a point at the center of one of these cells, and simulate diffusion from that point, you generate this flow field of how things would flow um, either you know, away from the center or back towards the center. So you see these pinwheels here where everything is pointing toward the center, okay? Um, and so the color is indicating sort of direction of flow. Um, and for a part of the cell that is uh, like this little elbow here, the idea is that you couldn't flow directly toward the center because that would cause you to leave the cell. So you'd first have to flow in this direction and then you could flow toward the center. So um, they've created these like flow fields maps um, for a series of images that they've trained the network on. And that's what's being uh, predicted for, for images that the network has never seen. Um, and this is a paper you can uh, read all about if you're interested um, by Carson Stringer at um, Janelia, who's starting her new lab, I think, now or very soon. Um, so this is a, another great option for looking at cells with a more complex morphology. And I'll also take you through one example of using that or testing it out to see if it would um, better fit your data. Um, as far as I know, this is not yet in Fiji. Um, and just like Stardust, um, they have trained it on a very large uh, data set so that it comes pre-trained and ideally works for you out of the box so that you don't have to train the network yourself and don't have to provide any labeled data of your own. Um, but one difference is, of course, because they have this theme of, of trying to find more unique and diverse cellular shapes, is they've also provided the network with um, probably even greater of a diversity of, of image types compared to Stardust, compared to that data science bowl data set. Um, you can see that it's uh, a number of different cells labeled in multiple colors, labeled in grayscale. Um, some cases where it's the membrane that's labeled and there's sort of dark inside. Um, and also some things that are not cells. So we have some shells here. We have some rocks here. And yet these look sort of cell-like. If you had an image, um, you could 
clearly see that the boundaries of these rocks are similar to some of our biological uh, data sets. And so I think the motivation of providing um, some diversity in the data set and not just our sort of typical microscopy images is to really try and make this robust to all different kinds of uh, cell labels and cell shapes. Um, and so you can definitely give this a try if you find that your uh, shape is a little bit too funky for a star convex polygon. Okay, so I think that's all I have. So I'm going to um, switch to sharing my desktop um, so that we can talk about, let's see, how to implement this. But does anyone have um, any questions while I'm switching over? I see any questions. Okay, um, cool. So hopefully you can see my desktop. Someone shout if you cannot. Um, so I mentioned that Stardust can be used um, in Fiji, which is why I'm sort of focusing on it. They're probably the ones with uh, the most user-friendly tools for, uh, I think, the image analysis community that frequents the HCBI. Um, so I'm gonna start there. And let's see, let's open up an image. So I'm going to start with these nuclei. OK, um, great. So here's an image of a bunch of nuclei, and we would like to segment these. So how might I do that? So first, I want to make sure that I have Stardust um, on my computer. So um, Doug has shown this previously, but just as a reminder, um, you want to make sure that you have the update site for Stardust uh, checked. Um, so if you go to update here, going to check for any updates for me. Which I shouldn't have because I just updated. OK, so I updated it before I did this so that I would appear to be good and say that my image day is up to date. OK, so manage update sites. So sorry, here. Image day updater, manage update sites. Um, then scroll down until you get to the S's and find Stardust and check it. And then close this. And then you're going to see some things pop up here. And then you can hit apply changes if you want to um, have Stardust in your, in your Fiji. And then you'd have to restart it. OK, so then you will be able to go into plugins, Stardust, and choose Stardust 2D. I'm going to select it. And um, there's a few different options here. Uh, first thing that I can say is you don't have to alter anything here. You can just press OK and see how it goes. And you can see that it does a pretty phenomenal job just by opening up a plugin and pressing OK, which is uh, not to be taken lightly. That doesn't always happen. Um, and so a few different ways to see these objects. Of course, it, it spits out um, a label image, but it also spits out a bunch of ROIs in the ROI manager. And so I can come over to this image and ask to show all these ROIs. Oops. Um, and I can see that it did a pretty fantastic job across an image with different cell intensities um, and even some sort of focus differences. This is a wide field image. Um, you can also, uh, if we want to, Synchronize, oops, uncheck this, synchronize our images. Um, we can zoom in on any particular point. Am I synchronized? Um, and you can sort of check, like here are these three, let's zoom in on this one instead. It's probably more useful. Um, these three here on my label image. Hopefully you can see my cursor on the uh, real image. Um, you can see that it segments these even though they're you know, very close together. Um, cells that are bright and dim, it's able to find all of them. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly mistakes, um, but I think it out of the box does a pretty phenomenal job finding uh, cells with a diversity of, of intensities and, and cells that are really close together. Um, so how might you perfect this if it was um, not working optimally. So if you go into plugin Stardust, Stardust 2D, um, there are some parameters here that I glossed over the first time just to show that you could just hit OK and it was as easy as that. Um, the first is you can choose the model. So these are these pre-trained models that they've uh, shipped with the plugin. Uh, the Versatile models, um, there's two for fluorescent nuclei and for H and E nuclei. Um, and there's also the sort of collective data science bold 2018. Uh, my understanding is that all three of these are trained 
on images from this uh, data science bowl um, data set, um, but that these are, are obviously separated into fluorescent versus H&E nuclei. Um, you'll also notice that you can add your own model. So um, I'll talk about that in a moment, but just be aware that you can add your own model if you'd like. Um, and then these slider bars here, these first ones I typically don't mess with. These are um, if you want to normalize images that you uh, input, uh, that you that you run through um, the network, um, you can change these these sliders here. I typically leave them the same. Um, but these two down here are maybe ones that you might mess with a little bit more. So this is deciding uh, sort of what are the polygons that I keep and throw away. So um, this score here, the score threshold, if you make it higher, it's going to give you fewer objects, fewer instances, um, but you might reduce any false positives. So if you consider, say, any of these dim nuclei false positives, um, then you might want to ramp this up. If it's not collecting the dim things or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever things it's, it's failing to find, you might turn this down. Um, the overlap threshold, if you uh, make it higher, you're going to allow more overlapping polygons. Um, and, and you can play around with those sliders and see what it outputs. If you ever get to a point where uh, you want to go back to the way it was when you uh, first downloaded it, just restore defaults and it'll go back to the beginning. Um, I wanted to show another image here um, that is slightly different from uh, sort of the optimal nuclei type image. And that's these neurons here. So these are still blob-like, but they're, they're not nuclei, they're cell bodies. These are neurons. Um, this is one that we trained a classifier on a couple of weeks ago when we were using Elastic. And you can come in here and do Stardust, Stardust 2D, um, and press OK. And again, it will output a pretty successful solution um, if we keep our ROIs here. Sorry. Um, we can see that it does a pretty good job. And in fact, you know, there are some closely touching uh, neurons that it does a pretty good job of finding both of them. Um, there are cases uh, where it fails. Um, let me turn up intensity here. Um, so there are, actually, I thought there were cases that it failed, but maybe they did a better job. Yeah, these are closely touching. Um, Oh yeah, there's one here that it failed on that it didn't find, and there's a really dim one here. So maybe we could play around with those thresholds and it would do better. Um, but pretty good out of the box, except you'll note that like, it's not really hugging the edges here, right? It's creating this blob that is, and clearly these are, are sort of triangular uh, shaped um, cell bodies, um, and it doesn't quite fit um, their shape perfectly. Um, but I think that in some applications, this might get you close enough. So they're, they're close enough to blob-like that a star convex polygon works pretty well. Um, but let me show you a case where it does not work well to motivate trying out something like cell pose. Um, so this is a very different image. So this is um, a shoot apical meristem, I think, which should be meaningful to people who work with plants. Um, I might be saying it wrong, but I think that's what it is. Um, and if I run Stardust on this, I think no matter where I put those thresholds, I'm going to get something incorrect out. So it's, I think, just picking up on any like bright spots in the, in the image like this here. So it's not doing a great job. And it's pretty obvious why, you know, these are, it's labeling uh, the membrane uh, structures. It's, it's not labeling uh, these bright blobs with a black background. And, and that's largely what this network was trained on. So, okay, it's not doing a great job. Um, one place that you can test out uh, cell pose is in a browser. So cellpose.org. This is a great way to just check and see if your images might warrant using um, cell pose. Now you have to upload PNGs or JPEGs and they have to be um, only 512 by 512. They have to be under 10 megabytes. So um, this is just for testing out. This isn't to like upload your massive Z stack and, and see how it goes. Um, just a single frame um, and maybe even a cropped tile and see how it looks. So I'm going to upload that image as a PNG. It will ask you for some information um, and hope this runs fast enough with me on Zoom. So I want it to segment cytoplasm. It's, uh, there's only one channel, it's a grayscale image. 
Um, there's no other channel here. And I already know that my average cell diameter, that, that 30 pixels is approximately right, so this is fine. And I can click Submit, and it will work for a second. And then it should spit out um, a pretty good segmentation. It usually is um, faster, I think, because I am on Zoom and someone else is also on Zoom. <laughs> it's slower. OK, so here you can see the predicted outlines. Um, you can also see the predicted masks, which are just those outlines filled in. And it does a really remarkable job. Um, it misses some things. And of course, if you actually had the full um, software, uh, you, could, you could change some thresholds and things. Um, but even just in this browser version, it does a pretty remarkable job out of the box, um, just like Stardust did on, on appropriate kinds of um, images. And uh, I could put in the other two images that I used in Stardust into this algorithm, and it also does a pretty nice job. Um, I think that if you really have have blob-like objects like nuclei, Stardust works really nicely. If you have um, more diverse shapes or diverse stainings, um, I would really try cell pose. I think it's a, a great option to try as well. Um, a couple more notes on ways that you can use these things. So um, for the case of Stardust, if you watch that YouTube webinar, what you'll find, what you'll hear um, in the second half, uh, the first half is by uh, Martin Weigert, who, uh, along with Uri, Uri Smith, um, made this Stardust algorithm. Um, but Martin starts by speaking about um, Stardust. And then in the second half, um, Olivier Burry, who runs uh, a image analysis and an imaging facility in Switzerland um, talks about how they've implemented pre-trained networks like this in their facility. And what they found is that in many cases, um, and just like the examples I showed you, I did not cherry pick those um, cell and nuclei examples. These are like images that we've been using in, in our demos before. Um, and they really did just work out of the box with Stardust. Um, you might find that, that it just works. And you just try an image, and, and it works really beautifully for your data set. But in some cases, um, you might find that you have to toggle some of those thresholds in Fiji, for example, in the plugin. Um, you might also find that you have to um, maybe downsample the image if the size of the nuclei is very different from uh, what the, the network has seen. Um, but despite all of those changes, you might find that it still just doesn't work for your images. Um, meaning that the pre-training that uh, has been done on this network, for whatever reason, it can, that, that model cannot, uh, say, extrapolate over to where your images exist in parameter space, and so it fails to segment your images. What they've found that's very successful is that you can retrain these models, not entirely from your own data, but you take the model from scratch, um, and you take the training set that's typically used, so from the data science bowl, all those images of nuclei, and you take, let's say, 500 of those images, and you take a small number of your own images, um, say 10 to 20 images, and you add it to the data set. And that is used to train the network. And then it outputs a custom model for you, which I showed you the, the point in the plugin where you could add in your own model. And that seems just that, that small bias to the data set of adding in a few of your own images, that seems to shift things enough to uh, improve the performance on your specific image analysis needs. And we can do this really easily at the HCBI. Um, we have not only GPUs on our workstations that we can use for training, but we also have uh, GPUs on the research computing cluster that we can use to train these networks. So if you try out these methods and you find that they're not working optimally and you'd like to provide some training data so that we can retrain it and see if we can optimize it a bit for your needs, um, then we can certainly do that. And so just reach out to us. Um, the other nice thing about some of these is that you don't just have to use them in Fiji, for example. Um, one thing I, I forgot to mention is that uh, that Stardust plugin is macro recordable in Fiji. So if you want to do some batch processing within Fiji, you can do that. Um, but you can also use this. Uh, both of these are Python packages. And so you can implement them directly in Python, or you can implement them in other places. And I'll just mention two. Um, one is in Zen, in fact, um, using a peer, um, which is a way to integrate your open source you know, Python scripts, uh, maybe even custom Python scripts, in the Zen universe. Um, and the people at, at Zeiss who work on that have already uh, taken Stardust and uh, 
transformed it into an appear plugin, a peer module, so that you can actually run Stardust in Zen. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, that might be helpful if you have these big tiled data sets. Um, they might work better if you analyze them in Zen, and we can use Stardust within that Zen universe, um, where they're really good at sort of processing this in sort of tile-based fashion. Um, and the other option, if you're working on, say, a Mac and you can't use Zen, um, is QPath. I've mentioned this before. This is a great software for analyzing big tile data sets, and um, you can use that to, uh, you can use Stardust, for example, um, within QPath to um, do this deep learning segmentation um, in a software that is well suited for these large tile data sets. So it sort of chunks your data up into tiles and processes it um, in that sort of uh, piece by piece fashion. So just wanted to mention those options um, to show that there's a lot of flexibility of implementing these methods in whatever sort of environment you're used to working in. Um, and of course, I'm not going through how to do all of that uh, because there's a lot of options. Um, but if any of those sound most compatible for you, um, then you should just reach out because I think that it's uh, really straightforward for us to um, implement it in whatever way is most helpful for you. Um, so that's all I have to say. If anyone has any questions um, or anything, even if it's not on deep learning for segmentation, uh, we can talk about anything as a typical image analysis office hours.